Test 2. Repeat sentence. Page 63. 1. Students who wish to apply for an extension should approach their tutors. Two. The research looked at neighbourhood cooperative schemes, such as community gardens. Three. Visual aids can make presentations clearer and more interesting. Four. Economy of scale is the increase in efficiency that occurs when more goods are produced. Five. The university is working towards being more environmentally sustainable. Six. Unlike applied arts, fine arts do not serve a practical function. Seven. Modern poetry often tests the conventions of language and rhythm. Eight. The law library is closed on Sundays and public holidays. Nine. There are no places left in the morning tutorial. Ten. The conference is predicted to draw greater numbers than last year.
Test two, retail lecture, page sixty-seven. One. I've been asked to speak today about the purpose of museums, and I think that's something we often take for granted. That we have museums and we need museums, but with so much information available now online, people have access to whatever it is they want to know. So, I think we need to consider carefully just what it is that we expect of our museums today, what makes them relevant in the information age. Clearly, we've got to move beyond the early twentieth-century concept of a warehouse full of old, remarkable, untouchable objects. This warehouse idea does very little to inspire people. What museum professionals need to do, what they should be doing, is make their collections and programs work towards the purpose of education. So whether that means having more hands-on exhibits, becoming involved with other community organisations, they should be doing whatever it takes to think about their visitors, to engage people, to educate them, and in that way they can be instruments of social change. If they have knowledge and understanding of the people who visit and the people they want to come and visit, they can take this as a starting point for providing exhibitions and services that are relevant to people's lives. Two. I suppose more and more people are starting to see graffiti as a form of art. Now there are still many who would beg to differ, and they'd point to the destructive scribblings that we see on our bus shelters and our public buildings. These often take the form of tags, which are fancy scribble-like versions of someone's name or nickname. Tags generally have no aesthetic appeal, and they are the scourge of the high street shopkeeper in many a town. I can certainly see where the shopkeepers and property owners are coming from. But the fact is, graffiti has been around for a very long time indeed. People left their mark on cave walls back in prehistoric times, and it's been found too on ancient monuments in Egypt and Rome. But New York-style graffiti, which is really the forerunner of a lot of the graffiti that's getting done now, New York graffiti took off in the late 1960s. That's when the advent of the spray can allowed the humble tag to evolve into more complex styles. In the mid to late 70s, subway trains became the new forum for graffiti artists to display their skills. For many young people, it became a medium to express their disillusionment with a system from which they felt excluded. Now, of course, the art establishment embraces graffiti artists, and some of these artists have actually taken on cult status. Three. We often think of technology and invention and research. As being somehow more sophisticated a proposition than nature, but actually, when we think about it, there are lots of really useful concepts that technology can take from the natural world. People are beginning to remember that other organisms on Earth are doing things in a very similar way to what we need to do, and they're looking closely at what we can learn from nature. Take the bright screens on our mobile phones. Now, this brightness, this effect that they've managed to achieve there. Came partly as a result of research into the iridescence of the wings of butterflies and the anti-reflective coatings that moths have on their eyes, and it doesn't end there. They're looking at what makes a spider's web so strong, how glowworms produce light with almost zero energy. The list goes on, and this area of research is called biomimicry. That's bio, as in biology or life, and mimicry, copying or imitating. It's a very interesting field of study. Test two, answer short question, page sixty-eight. One. What do we call the organs in our chest that we use to breathe? Two. If someone lives in an urban area, where do they live?
Three. What does a king or queen wear on their head at official ceremonies? Four. What do we call a book that contains lists of words with their meanings? Five. What is the source of solar energy? Six. When the writer of a book is unknown, what word is used for the author? Seven. What do we call a company or organization that gives money to a sports or arts event in exchange for advertising? Eight. What do we call the study of living things? Nine. What are winter, spring, summer, and autumn? Ten. What is a collective term for cows and bulls, especially on a farm? <laughs>